Edward R. Murrow observed in a speech at the Radio and Television News Directors Convention in 1958, I am entirely persuaded that the American public is more reasonable, restrained, and mature than most of the broadcast industry's planners believe. As if they had Murrow's comment in mind, in September of 1983, Robert McNeil and Jim Lehrer launched their most ambitious undertaking, the McNeer Lehrer News Hour, America's first national hour of evening news, for which Robin McNeil is executive editor and co-anchor. According to Mr. McNeil, public television has no point in existing in this country unless it can do something different far from or better than commercial television. Our measure of success, he goes on, is not in audience size, but in using the medium in ways that stretch its potential and satisfy hunger in the minds of our viewers. The McNear Lair News Hour has proven that there are lis listeners, viewers, who are indeed mature and who want the option of in-depth news reports. McNeil's journalism career began with five years at Reuters News Agency in London. He moved to television in 1960 as an NBC News London-based foreign co correspondent. In 1963, he was transferred to NBC's Washington Bureau. There he reported on civil rights and the White House. He covered the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in Dallas. And then he spent most of 1964 following the presidential campaign. In 1965, he became New York anchor of the first half-hour week news weekend news broadcast called the Shearer McNeil Report on NBC. Robin McNeil returned to London in 1967 as a reporter for the British Broadcasting Corporation's prestigious Panorama series. While with BBC, he traveled back and forth across the Atlantic covering such stories as a clash between anti-war demonstrators and the Chicago police in the 1968 Democratic National Convention. And the funerals of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Senator Robert F. Kennedy, and President Dwight D. Eisenhower. In 1971, he left BBC to become senior correspondent for the National Public Affairs Center for Television. He is a writer and presenter of the forthcoming nine-part series, The Story of English. Born in Canada, Mr. McNeil is a graduate of Carleton University in Ottawa. He is the author of two books, The People Machine, which currently biography cites as a blistering indictment of the commercial television's preoccupation with entertainment. In the right place at the right time, his second book, which chronicles experiences in his life as a journalist. Today, Robert McNeil speaks about the philosophy behind the McNear Lair News Hour, but in addition, he will discuss the nine-part series, The Story of English. We are pleased to have Robin McNeil. Please join me in welcoming him to City Club. Thank you very much indeed. I'm very pleased to be the uh, beneficiary of the popularity of the gas tax. <laughs> And it is also wonderful, uh, for the first time in quite a few visits to Portland, to be in your beautiful and sophisticated and clean city on such a gorgeous day as this. I'm sorry it's not a happier one for, um, for your community. Um, I'd like to start by telling you a story. In um, the early 60s, as you said, I was working for NBC in London and uh, a plane belonging to Flying Tigers Airline uh, carrying American 
uh, officers and their wives back to Europe had to ditch in the Atlantic at night, 600 miles west of Ireland. And uh, through some extraordinary courage and skill, uh, more than half of them got off into life rafts and survived, and it became at that moment the big world story. Nothing else earth shaking ha uh, happening. And the world's press descended on Shannon Airport to get the survivor story. Uh, I and an NBC crew included. And we got some early stories when uh, some um, early survivors were landed at uh, Shannon. And we were waiting for the rest when one night we were having dinner at Shannon Airport when our sound man, a um, um, elderly British gentleman who had a habit left over from the Second World War of listening to the shortwave radio, rushed into the restaurant and said, I just heard a shortwave report. The freighter carrying some of those survivors has had a fire on board. They have to be taken off. They've made a rendezvous for 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, uh, 10 miles due south of Cork, to have them helicoptered off. And we looked around at CBS and ABC and the BBC and the CBC and ITN and all our competitors, and we said we can get a real beat on them. So we left our food, which happened to be some Shannon Estuary lobsters, on the plates, and we rushed off into the night. And we drove all night down to Cork. On the way, I slipped in the dark and sprained my ankle. We got to Cork early in the morning. We managed to uh, hire a fishing boat for 10 pounds. The fishing boat chugged away from the dock. It took hours and hours. We all got seasick. We got covered with salt spray. We went 10 miles out, or so the fishermen said. We waited. There was nothing. We took hours to come back in again. By this time, we'd had nothing to eat for about 24 hours. We were furious. We got into the car. We heard that the survivors were just about to be landed at Kinsale, about 10 miles away roared through these narrow roads to Kinsale. We got there just as the survivors were, were being unloaded. And as our competitors were there, we set up our camera and uh, the survivors told their stories. And one of them was an American Army captain who described very affectingly how he and his wife held hands as they prepared to ditch, how when they ditched, there was no panic, but Suddenly there was darkness, the water was pouring in, the seats all broke loose and catapulted forward, and he didn't see his wife again. And he tried to keep control of himself, but he lost it, and he began sobbing. And all you could hear was him sobbing and the quiet whir of 16 millimeter cameras. That was over. We packed our camera up. We got ready to go back to Shannon to ship the film, which in those primitive days is what you had to do. And uh, just as we were leaving, in the lobby, I saw the captain trying to recover his composure, and a British TV reporter, who was late, rushed up to him and said, I'm terribly sorry. I was late. I didn't have time to set up my camera. Do you think you could just do that bit again? And the captain said, uh, looked haggardly at him and said, what bit? And he said, well, you know, the bit where you tell about your wife and then break down. And I thanked God that I had got there with all the roundabout route we'd taken so that I wasn't forced into some uh, callousness like that and that I had safely in a can under my arm, which we were taking back to ship, the bit. The bit that everybody who was competitive in that business at that time knew that he needed to get because that was the bit that the producers back home would run on newscast after newscast in that cycle. I didn't realize it then. It was only years later when I was looking at my profession through a much more jaded eye, because in those days I was very excited what I was doing and proud of what I was doing. Uh, but really, what an awful lot of television news is about is in getting that bit. It is the bit that is the most exciting, the most sensational, the most horrible, the most touching, the most frightening, whatever, you know the bit, because we all have in our memories, our visual memories, as a kind of private picture book of the history of this country and the world over the last couple of generations, a series of glimpses of those bits on television. And that is the primary reason why thousands of men and women, most of them very skilled, intelligent, highly motivated, and well-paid, are roaming the earth posting over land and ocean without rest to get that bit so that the audience at home can be briefly titillated, excited, saddened, 
diverted for a moment from its own private concerns by the spectacle of somebody else's misfortune. And the more I thought about it in later years, the more it seemed to me a really, uh, if not an absurd, waste of um, human energy and resources, uh, at least uh, only a very partial answer to how the television medium could be used as a medium of communicating information and a medium of journalism. Um, that, of course, has only become more intense as the competition at the network level has intensified and as the new technology, the portability and extreme uh, ease of using the new electronic technology has abetted that effort. It consumes most of television's resources. It is why television is so extraordinarily expensive to do, particularly at the network level. But, uh, as I said, not the only way that the medium could be uh, used. For a long time, the television networks uh, reminded me of Detroit. They would say, in effect, to the American public, not only that's the way it is, but that's the only way it is. They would, just as Detroit would say, um, ladies and gentlemen of America, you see that big thing out there that weighs two tons at the curb and has a lot of chrome and fins different every year on it. That is an automobile and you'd better admire it and crave for it and f uh, fill your fantasies with working hard to earn one of those because that is an automobile. Well, we discovered when the Japanese and the Europeans showed us, there are automobiles which more rationally fulfill the sort of criteria of transportation and the use of resources in one thing and another, and a lot of Americans opted uh, for a different definition of an automobile. Well, we felt that they could also opt for some of them for a different definition of a television news program. A news program that could free television journalism in a small corner from the prison of the successful formulas the purpose of commercial television, after all, is not primarily to make programs or deliver information or entertainment. It is primarily to deliver audience to sponsors in the appropriate demographics and at the most economic cost per thousand. That's the primary th purpose. And what passes as information, entertainment, or, uh, or news is almost secondary uh, to that purpose. Because of that, just imagine for a moment where the print technology, the Gutenberg technology, as it's fashionable to call it nowadays, would be if that had been the dominating ethic uh, back at the um, end of the uh, 15th century, the beginning of the 16th century. If, um, if what would only sell absolutely the maximum number of books would be published, and that anything less than that, by comparison or rivaling it, would not be published. I think we would have the world's libraries looking like the sort of uh, very pop end of the airport bookstore today. Um, it, is, it is making of news in our business a commodity which can be shaped and reworked and modified and turned on its head or whatever is necessary to achieve the ultimate purpose, which is the maximum audience for that particular time slot. Some good journalism happens as a result of it, but some bad journal journalism happens as a result of it. It uh, trivializes, makes too brief, encapsulates often irresponsibly, puts things out of context, over-sensationalizes and over-dramatizes all th uh, objections that aren't original with me. Many, many of my colleagues in the commercial networks have said so and would agree with me. But what's happened over two generations in the television medium is that these formulas and the techniques that achieve them have become converted kind of into imperatives and laws of the medium, as though General Sarnoff, wherever he now is, before he left us, had handed down from the mountain tablets of clay with these things inscribed, no item shall last longer than one minute. Um, the attention span of the audience will not exceed 45 seconds. And a belief has sprung up in the medium, understandable, because the formulas work, that that is the only way to, uh, to, uh, to, to use the medium, and that these limitations, these imperatives, are somehow inherent in the medium itself. Um, as a result of that, the uh, viability, what has come to be regarded as viability on television, 
has established criteria which infect all other corners of our life. They have drastically transformed sports in this country and almost anything you could think of, the other institutions uh, that you can think of, certainly politics, uh, to a large degree uh, religion in its popular sense. Um, I've mentioned sports, certainly mass entertainment, and certainly news. Anyway, starting 10 years ago, we decided to test these assumptions and test the criteria uh, of brief attention span, of slavish dependence on the availability of action picture uh, in news, and uh, the uh, corollary of that, that if action picture were not available, stories were only briefly mentioned or not covered at all, and a built-in industry contempt for the talking head and that we would try to program uh, not as the, my commercial colleagues are forced to do, for the inattentive and the uninterested, as well as the attentive and interested, that we would be able and free to program in news for the attentive and the interested. Commercial television is terrified, obviously, to lose anybody from its audience, whether they're unattentive, ill-informed, uninterested, whatever. No, it's, it's, it's true. And so you have to do things that keep those people there and keep them diverted and keep rockets going off or cars screaming around the corner or whatever to, um, to, to, to keep them there. We, when we set out 10 years ago, couldn't afford to send people and camera crews all over the world to get the bits that I described earlier. All we could afford to do was to rehabilitate the despised talking head and to do some hasty rationalization among ourselves that the talking head, after, after all, still was the primary means of human com communication and therefore wasn't a bad communications medium in itself. And the things that really matter to human beings, um, I love you, I hate you, will you marry me, I want to divorce you, you're hired, you're fired, those things are usually communicated to other human beings by talking heads. <laughs> And, and they don't usually have a box over the shoulder with cartoons whizzing by in it while they're, while they're doing it. Um, but television has shown an extraordinary ability to hire the most expensive and brilliant communicating talking heads you can find in this talented land, and then to do everything possible to distract attention from them uh, while they, when, they, when they put them on the screen. So. We set out to do what we could with a half-hour program that essentially used news sources as the ingredient who would be interviewed, debriefed on the air. In doing this, and we sort of rationalized this later, we sort of stumbled on a process or on a, on a formula that moved the traditional journalistic process one step backwards. All journalists, all reporters, when they're covering a story, they go out and either on the telephone or in person interview the best news sources they can get to. Then they come back in and they take the quotes from those interviews and they feed, they create at their typewriter or their word processor or ever, they create a synthesis of the material they've learned feeding in the quotes as apposite to the kind of thesis or synthesis that they've put together. What we did was arrange to debrief the best two, three, or four news sources of varying points of view that we could assemble debrief them, let the audience look over our shoulders as they were seeing that part of the debriefing process, and then let the audience make the synthesis that tra traditional journalists made for them. And without really understanding what we were doing, we touched a chord there because it gave the exercise a lot of credibility in the minds of an audience, an American television audience, that 10 years ago was just beginning to utter the complaint which is now fairly common. We don't want television all the time telling us what to think. Um, we set it up like a small newspaper. We had a bunch of reporters, small at first, now up to 14. We gave them beats. They were responsible for finding out what was going on in their areas of the news, and particularly for identifying, to identify those individuals who made news. In every one of your areas of life, this is what I communicated to our young reporters when we began, there are people who know what the news is. The doctors among you here know what the medical news is in your specialty. The lawyers here know. The insurance people know. It's funny I mentioned those three groups at the moment. All uh, 
intertwined as they are in a very interesting story. But uh, uh, everybody in his own walk of life knows what the news is and he knows 90% of what the front page story is going to be when one thing happens, a yes, a no, a decision for or against, a death of somebody, a movement somebody out of a position that is going to make the story become a story. So what m most journalists do is try and get to the people who know what's going on in those areas and then they're ready and they essentially know what most of the news is. If you read Foreign Affairs magazine, most of what is the front page news story now, probably in the last 18 months, 75, 80% of it is contained in a long takeout article there. Probably 60% in the book that um, um, someone in a university who knows an area of the world wrote two or three years ago. What actually makes news is only the tiny little peak of the iceberg that happens on the day. So if your resources are slim, you can anticipate a great deal, and that is what we try and do. We also um, subtracted ourselves from the process as interviewers in a rather deliberate decision. Partly it fitted our personalities, Jim's and mine, but also we rationalized, look, we're going to be there every night. We don't need to be fighting for exposure and airtime. We're there all the time. The, our viewers will come to perceive the world filtered through us anyway. The most useful exercise is to, we can do, is to pay the guests we've invited onto the program because they're the principal resource, the compliment of helping elicit from them what they were invited there to say and not take a kind of um, belligerent or prosecutorial posture towards them uh, which is uh, frequently done on television and is largely a theatrical exercise anyway, uh, that we would, uh, we would to some extent remove ourselves and use ourselves as interlocutors who were there to elicit, to challenge and test, but not to beat people over the head and act like Perry Mason when he's got a witness in the, uh, witness in the dock. Because our resources were slim, we had to go for targets of opportunity, and even in the news hour, as we've moved on, we've had to do that as well. We can't go out and shoot things everywhere all the time, and although we've now moved into the documentary area on the hour, we have to select carefully. An example would be the series that Charles Krauss and Susan Mills did on the Philippines last summer, which I thought was an extremely prescient and graphic series on, the, um, on how shaky were the pretensions of the Marcos regime to any kind of popular support, and also documenting the real unhappiness there was with him at the time. I thought the series that Charlene did uh, in South Africa, called Apartheid's People, did a similar thing. We had been saying for months, God, I wish we could go there and show how people, re what it's really like living under apartheid. We keep using this word all the time, but what is it like really living under it? And I think to a large degree, considering the enormous restrictions she worked under, she did a brilliant job of that. And uh, she was just awarded the other day the most prestigious award you can win in television journal of journalism, a Peabody, for that series. And, uh, and, and very well deserved, I thought. Three years ago, actually it started five years ago, PBS suggested to us, Larry Grossman has now moved over to NBC News, that our half hour, which had established itself and was a good supplement or complement to commercial television news, that our half hour should be expanded to an hour. We said, yes, gulp yes, we will do it if you can demonstrate that there is financial support for it and that there is support in the system. Anyway, two years later, after two years of really intense politicking, which Jerry uh, Appy of uh, Oregon Public Television knows only too well, it was accepted uh, on the PBS schedule with a lot of blood on the floor politically, not from the Portland station or from Oregon, but from other parts of the country, and it was launched. It went pretty badly the first year. We were very experimental in the, um, truly experimental in, uh, in in doing this hour. Nobody had ever done an hour of national news before. Everybody knows how to do a half hour of very quick paced news. Uh, it's fairly easy to do that and keep the audience's attention. It is much more difficult to carry the philosophy, as we tried to do, to carry the philosophy of a longer attention span and a more thoughtful presentation, analytical presentation, over to a multi-item program. Give people a sense of comprehensiveness and uh, at the same time 
retain the, in, the tension which is absolutely necessary in any kind of performance. I mean, it is, it's absolutely clear that television is a performance in a way that a newspaper story is a performance or a theatrical performance or a concert. You kind of give the audience the end of a piece of string at the beginning and you pull it taut and, and while you may want to vary the tension, you mustn't let it go. We let it go in the first year a lot. We really just got it wrong. As I was saying to some people here last night, we, we thought that we could pepper or season the slower, more analytical stories with lots of bits of hard news, like sprinkling, sprinkling pepperoni over something, only it didn't work. Uh, the hard news bits made the long features things seem out of place or vice versa. The uh, pauses that we put in to let people reflect had half the system saying, what are they about? What are they for? It really didn't work. At the same time, about three months into the exercise, Jim had a heart attack and he was out for three months. The thing very nearly fell apart. But at the end of the first year, we were able to recognize, I think, what was wrong with it. And with some good advice from the stations, we made a lot of drastic changes. We put the hard news back where it traditionally belongs at the top of the show in as clean and uh, simple a, uh, a news summary as we can do and then gave a logical definition to the rest of the program, focus sections, which you're familiar with, uh, dividing the pace and the texture as much as we could between studio discussion, newsmaker interviews, uh, documentary reportage, sometimes to set up a studio discussion, sometimes to stand on its own, and the essays, which we're very proud of. I think it has now turned around, and there's quite a bit of, quite a bit of evidence that it has, in the last year, the audience has uh, gone up 27% nationally. It's doing very well here in Portland, where we're now getting a 7% share of the audience, which won't make anybody in commercial television uh, commit suicide, but for public television, is a very healthy audience. Um, in, uh, in New York and some other places with the recent crises, we have peaked the highest audience we've uh, ever had at the peaks. All new shows benefit from crises. They go up, they go up briefly. And I think the crises have shown the value of, the, uh, of a program like ours. We do not, we're not in the business of having to make the news more exciting. We don't have to sensationalize the news. We don't have to sell the news to make our news more vivid than somebody else's news. In fact, we find ourselves often in the role of saying, uh, in effect, uh, hey, wait a minute. I mean, isn't there another way of looking at this? And um, and we're quite successful at that. I think during the Libyan crisis, uh, we, uh, we had a number of very sobering discussions, uh, which tended to go against the grain of the sort of self-congratulation that gripped this country in the, um, in the first uh, few days after the Libyan raid. I think during the uh, Chernobyl uh, disaster in the last two weeks, we've also been able was again, there was a kind of, not only a rush to judgment and a rush to condemnation, but also, and I think uh, rather distressingly for this country, because this is not a country of mean-spirited or, um, or, uh, or um, ungenerous people, but a rush to, uh, to almost, uh, almost to gloat on behalf of some American officialdom and some parts of the press that the Russians were in this kind of trouble. And I think our program was able to, as everybody was rushing to one side of the ship, and it was all leaning that way, a few of us to walk over to the other side and ask some questions quite early on about, well, could the Russians actually be telling something near the truth in this? And a number of people said yes. And I think as it comes out that uh, while they certainly were very tardy, and if the evidence had not been seen in Scandinavia, the chances are they might have kept it as yet another secret disaster in Russia. But given the circumstances, uh, what they are now, what they've been saying all along, begins to look closer and closer to the truth. So we can play that, that hey, wait a minute role quite a lot of the time and uh, go against the grain without feeling that we're going to suffer for it. Um, the, um, it is gratifying, this uh, exercise for us. We have been, in a small way, able to redefine television news and I don't make any claims more than in a small way. But if you look around at the television news now, uh, in the, at the network level, 
you'll see a lot of things that didn't used to be there. Nightline, which was, which is a great program, which I know because ABC was trying to hire me at the time, was um, was directly born out of our idea. They watched it very closely. This week with David Brinkley owes a lot in conception to the things that we did. Um, the three morning programs on the networks now do a great many more, many more interviews down the line and discussions than they ever did before. And I was even amused to see in the New York Times the other day a long feature about how network news anchors were now doing live interviews with newsmakers in the, in the uh, beginnings of their programs. And uh, I think that's just, um, that's just fine. <laughs> it is gratifying to us the quality of our audience, not just the size. Um, it is, uh, I think, confirmation of the initial presumption that there, was, there were X million Americans out there who were either disappointed in or frustrated by or annoyed at or whatever, the pro only product that was available. And they have come out in large numbers. We now have four to five million people across this country a night watching the program. Eleven to twelve million people a week say they have watched one program in the last week. 27 million people say they have watched one program in the last month. Now, if you're in the newspaper or magazine business, those are absolutely fantastic numbers. Uh, Wall Street Journal, which is the biggest circulation of any newspaper in this country, has 2.2 million. So uh, it justifies, I think, that initial skepticism about a system that said that no program uh, that can get 10 million people is viable if any other program can get 12 or 15 million people, which I think is just is, is such a logical absurdity in communications. And it took television to kill that idea in the magazine industry, and now the magazine industry has reformed itself and is very prosperous, catering to, catering to hundreds of special interest groups, ultimately with the increased um, technology of television and the multiplicity of channels and an end to the kind of tyranny of the three networks, perhaps we will see that uh, appearing in television. But it is gratifying the quality as well as the numbers of that audience. Our demographic surveys tell us that we have a very high proportion of activists, of people who belong to institutions like this, who are people who write to congressmen, certainly people who vote, people who join committees, get involved, um, people who are activists in their, in their civic affairs and in the democracy of this country. We even had a survey the other day showing that we were the most mentioned, or as the favorite program, of the U.S. Congress, Sec uh, with Cosby second. I think that probably only shows that the Congress is even more out of touch with the mood of the country than I thought it was, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, it is also gratifying to us that we have been able uh, to help redefine the possibilities of television news a little bit. We have also been, I think, quite instrumental in helping to define public television. Um, in, in other words, by our presence there every night to help the American public understand what public television is, because a lot of people are still puzzled by that, including some people in public television. Um, the, uh, there is a movement in public television, uh, as money has been getting scarce, to go whoring after ratings to, uh, as the way of justifying the existence of programmers and people and their career uh, possibilities. Um, it is a, uh, to me, a fundamental perversion of the purpose of public television. Uh, uh, there is a very amusing definition of uh, public television by Tom Shales, the rather wicked critic of the Washington Post, who said that most public television schedules are composed of animals mating and English people talking. <laughs> occasionally interrupted by English people mating and animals talking, which is uh, Well, at least you know what network you're watching, you see. When you're, um, and uh, as, as your chairman uh, said in introducing me and quoted me, um, I, I believe we, the only business we have in public television, otherwise we might as well pack up and go away, um, is to do things uh, better than uh, or different 
from what commercial television does. Otherwise, I think it's arrogant in the extreme to be begging for the public's money because we don't have any purpose. If you're just going to do weak imitations, pale imitations of what commercial television does, you might as well go out of existence. And I am proud of the fact that our program has, uh, I think, lived up to that definition. And uh, we are confident that within our own criteria, it is both better than and different from commercial television. Thank you. Time now for questions from the audience, and uh, the microphone is set up. The questions are limited to members of City Club. Please identify yourselves as you. Gail Acteman, board host, will pose the first question. M Mr. McNeil, after that fine discussion of matters related to uh, television journalism, I'd like to ask a question that doesn't relate directly to that subject, but instead the subject of Oregon's uh, senators in the United States Congress. As a longtime observer of the political scene in Washington, I'd be very interested in observations that you may have on the effectiveness of Senator P Hatfield and Senator Packwood, because we Oregon Oregonians are now enjoying the fact that our senators uh, have positions uh, in the Congress and the Senate uh, that they haven't enjoyed previously. I, um, I'm often asked that question when I go around different places, and I usually dodge it. <laughs> Some states, I, go, I haven't heard of the senators, so... Um, <laughs> but um, I, I don't think that you need me to tell you that you have two extremely visible and uh, prominent and e effective senators. Uh, um, Mr. Hatfield, um, uh, established that reputation years and years ago, and uh, Mr. Packwood more recently, and uh, his skill in, uh, in managing to pass this uh, rather radical uh, proposal for tax reform. I say proposal because it's obviously got a long way to go, is both his parliamentary skill and his, um, his knowledge of the subject are, are apparent and uh, adds, I think, enormously to the prestige he's, uh, he's earned since he became the chairman. Um, I'm not going to comment on either of their politics. That's not my business to do in public. But uh, I don't think, as I say, that uh, you, this, uh, this audience, as well informed as it is, needs me to tell you that you have uh, two extremely effective and uh, energetic senators and prominent. Yes, Rex Armstrong, City Club member. I wanted to say that I've got a seven-month-old son who is fascinated by the intro and the conclusion to your show, which basically stops whatever he's doing and that looks at it. tells me something if he's around for the conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> it also says something about the nature of television, that it works well for that, that intellect uh, when it has that... <laughs> When that portion has that quality, it's the AT&T feature that he really finds fascinating. But um, I was curious, there have been instances, at least from the perception I've had, when uh, an issue which has been treated and the people who've been interviewed didn't work very well, when basically you've done something that had an uh, obvious purpose but didn't seem to be carried off particularly well. I'm curious if you ever come back to an issue, frequently you'll end by saying, we'll get back to that or, you know, we can't resolve it now, we'll deal with it later. And it doesn't seem you often do deal with it later, but it's a good way to end that portion. But, it, <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious whether you literally just come back to something because you don't feel you did the job you wanted to do. Uh, yep. Uh, we, um, I mean, we frequently miss. If you do something every night, I don't care what it is, uh, the chances are you're going to have bad nights. And when you're leaving as much to... Um, to chance, as uh, we do, with live guests who are unedited and um, aren't always the ideal guest. You don't have a choice always of their number one, your A cast. 
And sometimes your A cast disappoints you. Somebody isn't as vehement in public as he is in the pre-interview and that kind of thing. And sometimes it just doesn't work. I frankly am disturbed, not disturbed, but we have a lot of discussion about what little payoffs we should use when we want to interrupt a discussion and move on to something else. Because um, I think it is, uh, it annoys me when other television programs, and we do it ourselves, say, well, that's the end of our time, we've got to move on after too brief a discussion and somebody's appetite for the subject has just been whetted. I mean, time is in the command of the people who run the program. And to make it sound as though it's God that is moving you on, or, or television, is, is arrogant. And, you know, the morning shows do it all the time. And I, we try and avoid that. But you, you feel you have to make a little apology to some people. And one of the more graceful ones we came up with a few years ago is, oh, well, we'll have to, become, we'll have to come back to that. <laughs> Obviously, we haven't been able to really do justice to it now. And we, uh, we say that, and it's become a kind of tick. And uh, I, I think we'd be better to get out of it a bit um, <laughs> and just say thank you. <laughs> but we, we, I tell you when we do come back to a subject very deliberately and quickly is when we, it just hasn't worked out and one side has had all the running because somebody hasn't shown up um, or somebody just made a very bad showing for one side or we've had some technical interruption down the line. We've done that a number of times where we just come back the next night or a couple of nights later and do it again. We will always, most of the stories we do are not just one-time stories. Most stories are part of a continuum. And uh, we do eventually come back. Quite often though, to be honest, we wait until it's become ripe again in our rather arbitrary way of looking at these things. But, um, um, it is one of the problems of the program is that, uh, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. The program has a reputation which it merits to a degree, but then it creates expectations of thoroughness and in-depth and uh, impartiality and everything else that are very hard to fulfill and make it a television program. I mean, we can't, there isn't an issue that we do that probably doesn't justify a full-fledged hour-long or even two-hour debate. You know, I mean, it's hardly an issue. Um, and obviously you can't do that and on every issue, and certainly in keep an audience, a general audience, for a so we have to cut things off, and uh, we regret it. I think one thing we're trying... I'll take just another moment on this question. It reminds me of something else. One of the things we lost in going to the hour was the subtlety and nuance, which was, I think, a, um, if not a hallmark, at least it was something we could be proud about in the half-hour program, and mechanically was made easier by often having three or four points of view on an issue. When you do a number of issues and you treat many of them with just two guests, an inevitable polarization and oversimplification happens, a kind of black and whiteness takes over. And whatever subtleties or nuances those two guests may be aware of, they feel compelled to argue with each other in the simplest points. And I don't know whether, but I, I hope that regular viewers of the program will notice that over the last year, uh, we have tried on many, many more occasions now to repair that weakness by simply saying to ourselves, if this story is important enough to do, it's important enough to do in the old style with four guests, and we'll only have two focus stories that night instead of three. Now, we don't want to do it every night because I think it really would um, seriously disrupt the rhythm of the program, and it's got to be something that we apprehend is important enough to the audience to make enough of you want to sit there and listen to it all, but we are trying to get away, not altogether, but to some degree from the sort of polarized two-guest interview, which more often than not leads to that kind of conclusion. We'll have to come back to it. Yes, next question. I'm Charles Sykes, a longtime member of this club and an inveterate watcher of your program. It does seem to us that in stretching to the hour format uh, that sometimes you uh, have uh, fallen into a problem of stretching out the uh, available evidence to fit the time frame 
which ends up belaboring a subject beyond its uh, a proper return. Another aspect of the same situation in attempting to get uh, uh, dramatic responses uh, seems to us uh, indicated by uh, Judy's occasional abrasiveness, uh, which uh, apparently happens sometimes when she's beyond her depth. I wonder uh, if, if this continues to be a problem in your uh, developing your perfection. Gee, you know, I, I didn't know there was going to be criticism here. I mean, it's <laughs> we can... You haven't been properly informed about the <laughs> format. I mean, we can handle praise, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, I, uh, I think we're um, on belaboring a point and stretching things beyond its thing. I think it's inevitable. I think some newspaper, serious newspapers occasionally uh, carry a story that's too long. I think it is a risk I would be prepared to take as opposed to the opposite, which is cutting everything too short. I think an occasional danger of going too long on a story is probably better in the long run who are trying to fulfill our purposes than going too short. Um, I feel that we probably err too often on the side of being too brief on a subject. Because if we've opened it up to the degree that we have, um, you have just begun to engage people's curiosity, I think, and then cut it off. So I, that's my own personal feeling about that. I think we're all driven to be abrasive at times or impatient at times um, with uh, with guests and uh, and each of us has different styles and I think the uh, the mixture of styles is good is good for the program and uh, I think Judy is one of the absolutely top people in the business she's a very she's incredibly skilled in an all-round way very few other people have all the skills of television in the way she has. The ability to do a live interview, put together documentaries, write as well as she does, anchor as well as she does. They're all different skills, and she has them in, to an amazing degree. And um, I am uh, an enthusiastic defender of the lady. Uh, so. <laughs> Is there another question? <laughs> uh, I'm Victor Blumenthal, member of the City Club. Uh, you seem to have a unlimited number of people to interview, and uh, particularly senators and congressmen and so on. Uh, it, it seems like they just come when you call. Is that uh, the truth, or, or to tell? Give, I'd like to know a little bit of background. Well, I'll tell you how we do it. Um, it's become easier as the program has become better known. I think that's, that's evident. Um, and uh, the program's reputation for giving people a chance to get a fair shake at getting their point of view out also has helped. Um, as far as Capitol Hill is concerned, it's a very widely watched program in Washington, and therefore they're talking in a way to that, to their peers and their constituency, and they like to come. Fundamental reason we get good people reasons are two. One is, as I described earlier, we have reporters who cover those beats, and so when there's an economic story, you're not in the plight of some television programs I've worked for, including the BBC in England, where they do a lot of discussions of sitting around, because everybody's a generalist saying, gee, we should do something on the economy. Um, they wouldn't say, gee, in Britain, they'd say something else, but uh, we should do something on the economy. We need an economist. Isn't there a chap called Galbraith? He's an economist, you know. Um, Milton Friedman, he's an economist. Uh, we have people who know and are in touch with and have cadres of people they can, um, they can uh, come on, uh, get on. We don't by any means uh, get everyone we like when we want them. Often we have to make do with the second or third cast. And the way of avoiding that, particularly on stories like the economy or anyone involving a profession, is to try and anticipate a week or a few days in advance on what day that story is going to be ripe and it will be enough in the public mind that they'll be interested in it because then you can book the guests in advance and that is a lot of the secret of getting really good guests is booking them in advance. Now some people are very willing to drop everything and come at a moment's notice. We have down the road from the Washington station where many of these guests come 
there's a restaurant, if you can call it that, called the Weenie Beanie. And we have an expression on the program that the guest who's really easy to get and uh, who's really eager to be on the program is waiting at the Weenie Beanie. <laughs> and we have uh, life member Weenie Beanies and we have uh, Hall of Fame Weenie Beanie ones and uh, we have some whose shirt number has been hung up because they're so eager to <laughs> be on. Neither of your senators is uh, one of those. But, uh, <laughs> Next question, we'll try to get all three in. Okay. Joella Whirling, club member. I'd like to ask you about the story of English. Is it about uh, mating or language? <laughs> and <laughs> as some, someone who works for a commercial station, you'll sell more copies if it's about mating. I, uh, <laughs> uh, th that reminds me, apropos of that. No, we actually had a station manager uh, in one public television station when we complained to him about the hour at which he was carrying the news hour because it seemed so unfitted for his community and our audience. And we said, why can't you put us on at seven o'clock or even eight o'clock? He said, if you could show animals mating, only he used a much earthier uh, euphemism, then we could put you on at seven o'clock. <laughs> the uh, story of English is a uh, nine part series that we have made, we, McNeil Lehrer, have made in conjunction with the BBC, uh, based on an idea by a young writer and editor in Britain, to tell the story of the English language, where it came from 16, 1700 years ago. It was the language of a savage, obscure tribe on the shore of Northwest Europe. Today, it is the language that has conquered the world. And it's the story of that, and how it's spread all over the world, and why it is spoken differently everywhere. And while it is as lively a kind of regurgitation of the standard scholarship on the history of the language as we could make, it is also something and adds to the scholarship with something that is unique that a television series can do that, that scholars can't do in books. And that is, it, within a two-year time frame, it is a living example, a frozen moment of how the language is spoken in Singapore, in Australia, in parts of India, in Canada, all over the United States, the Caribbean, and so on, around the world, China, uh, you have it. And it is full, I think, of really stunning bits of language and other geographical um, stuff that I just didn't know before, uh, even given my Scots background. I'll just give you one example. Uh, there's a whole program devoted to this, one of the nine. The language that is now reconquered, the dialect of English, or the variety of English that is now reconquering the world through pop songs and, um, and that culture, the sort of southwestern dialect of this country, um, is the direct offspring of the lowland Scots who were moved by King James I to Northern Ireland, creating Ulster, the Ulster colony, creating all the trouble that since flowed from that, a hundred years after the colony was created, about 50,000 of them moved in a short time to the colonies here. They, because they were so boisterous and rough, the English and Germans who'd already arrived, particularly in Pennsylvania, let them pass through, and it would take them a good land, let them pass through the Cumberland Gap, down through Appalachia. They became the mountain men, David Crockett and the like. They became the Indian fighters. They became a large part of George Washington's army. He said he couldn't have won the war with the uh, War of Independence without them. They spread down through Appalachia. They are the, acts, the basis of the accent, modified by their influences of the Carolinas, and then of the Ozarks and across through Missouri and into the Southwest. And so that you have in North Carolina a storyteller playing his mouth organ and sitting there up in his mountain uh, house telling a jack tale, like Jack and the Beanstalk, only another one, that directly relates to a jack tale we have being told by a man in heavy Scots dialect in Aberdeen, 300 years apart, the same stories, but the same thing. And it's, to me, all that's just fascinating. And um, it's, uh, so anyway, that's what that series is. Yes, I know you're anxious to get out of here, so Thank um, you. we deal with the others quickly. I'm a Jim Nelson member. Uh, I am a member of an advisory council of a Portland public radio station. My colleagues and I spend literally hundreds of hours each year begging for the elusive contributor's dollar. Do you have a better idea 
Uh, and do you think Congress should help us? Well, I was asked about earlier today about Mr. Reagan's attitude, this administration's attitude to public broadcasting. And uh, all I can say is I, like you, would prefer that this administration had a generous attitude to it, uh, as some previous ones have done, because I think it's, um, I think it's shown its worth in the country. And uh, I'd hate to see it go, have to go all the way down the road to commercialization in order to survive. The um, problem is that I think it's very arrogant for us to be trying to say that we should be an exception or an exemption at a time of the kind of budget strictures. If food stamps are being cut, then I think public broadcasting has to be cut. Um, whether food stamps have to be cut and all the other things, all the other social programs is a political argument that we can all have privately, but it's, it's, I don't think we can claim exemption from that. I would prefer that there were an administration that really wanted to fund it generously. Um, in the meantime, I, uh, I know that uh, a lot of fundraising appeals are self-defeating. There is an audience resistance to them building up. And one public station in Florida has even gone to the extent of promising its audience it won't have any on-the-air fund drives if they will renew, spontaneously renew, or take out new memberships in sufficient numbers. That's so far working, but how many years that will last, I don't know. But I have deep sympathy, particularly with the NPR problem, which is even greater than uh, the television problem. And in saying that, I, I speak as somebody who listens to Morning Edition every day and think it is one of the finest news programs anywhere on any medium. I can't listen to All Things Considered because I'm busy then, but when I have, I like that too. And I think, th I think National Public Radio terribly is one of the best kept secrets in this country. It is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful service. It is the only, not the only, but it is virtually the only civilized radio in this nation. And uh, I speak as somebody who started his career with the CBC, you see, so, uh, okay, uh, one last question? Yes. I'm Susan Butrell, and I first want to thank you for crediting your audience with intelligence. We do appreciate that. Uh, my is question. That right? <laughs> <laughs> my question is, in view of Chernobyl and its aftermath, and Gorbachev's renewed uh, proposal for a banning on nuclear testing, do you think, as a news person, that this issue will be in the spotlight and discussed? Well, it'll, it may be discussed, but I think the um, administration has made pretty clear that uh, it's not going to go along with that, that it is going to uh, repeat its arguments that it needs to test to keep the American deterrent up to snuff, um, and that it would be um, falling into Gorbachev's trap if it, uh, if it joined that. Um, I, um, I'll just add one more thing, because I know you want to adjourn. I, it, it amazes me, actually, on many of these issues, how much the public debate in this country and the press follows the sort of thrust of the administration. I don't just mean the Reagan administration. I mean all administrations on these big issues of foreign policy. And when it comes to relations with the Soviet Union, somehow the climate is set in the White House and if it's cloudy there, the country reflects the cloudiness. If it's sunny there, like the old little Swiss weather, you know, the cuckoo clocks with the weather barometer, the ugly old lady and the nice, nice young girl, um, it just seems to be that the whole country swings that way. Now, obviously, there are dissenting voices, and the press raises them, and, but the, it just, the, the whole kind of momentum seems to go the, uh, the way the administration intends. So, just looking at it, to answer your question very simply, I wouldn't imagine there would be a huge debate on that. Thank you. Robin McNeil, thank you for joining us today for a wonderful show. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you. We are adjourned. A reminder about next Friday's program.